a Ponza city that is a that is a themed AI. So you find a lot of uh, startups and applications like the one that we'll be sharing today that uh, is themed around AI. We have the game, board games, like this is Starcraft 2. Basically, you have a board game, a, a game played by computer and a human being and a computer uh, algorithm that is behind the game beating human beings. This is a very interesting uh, art that was created using AI and it sold that. So you have a mimic of an original uh, paint, but now done by AI. And then it is sold at uh, US dollar for 30,000. You can convert this into Kenya shillings. And of course, demand for AI and data scientists has gone up. And uh, the projection is in the future, 50% of the jobs will be replaced by AI. And of course, every technology has its challenges. Maybe towards the end, the prof can moderate a section where we discuss with the challenges of AI. So in terms of news, so applications, the industry outlook, in terms of movies, there are a lot of movies which are themed AI. I don't know which of these movies you have watched. You can write, you can indicate on the chat, The Terminator by Schwarzenegger, The Matrix by a guy called Neon. So you find all of these movies are themed AI. And uh, when they start, they look like science fiction movies, but with time, then the applications become a reality. And of course, our applications are daily life. So this is on our phones. Yesterday, we had a session somewhere in Westlands where we were discussing about assistive technologies to help the blind and the, those who have challenges with the hearing. And you realize most of the modern phones come with a lot of assistive technologies. So all this then is what society gets to know about AI, but that's not all. What about researchers? So I picked three researchers. We call them the fathers of AI. One is Alan Turing in the 1950s, and his interest was I propose to consider the question, can machines think? So the emphasis here was machines that can think. I remember thinking as an internal process. Then another a scientist called John McCarthy, who is a mathematician and computer scientist. His definition was branch of computer science concerned with making computers behave like humans. So here the key is behavior. So here it was thinking, here is behavior. So whatever me and do, uh, whatever me and you does that involves intelligence, we put that into machines, we call it artificial intelligence. And then there's another gentleman called Minsky, who is a cognitive and computer scientist. And his definition is making machines do things that will require intelligence if done by men. So again, the key word here is something me and you do that involves intelligence. If you take that and put it into machines, we call that artificial intelligence. And I'm just looking at some papers that basically talks the same. I was looking at AI in the news. So again, we get to know about AI in the news. I quickly look at some of the leading AI technologies in terms of trends. So we have generative AI. I think Dr. Nder will talk about this one later. Embedded AI and user UX focused AI. So a lot of HCI in uh, artificial intelligence. I looked at, uh, this is a very interesting uh, 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 post about AI head teacher pointed at UK boarding school. So you have an AI head teacher as opposed to a normal human head teacher. I looked at a few, this may interest some of you. We are in the era of sex robots and uh, I don't know whether they have been packaged to this part of the world, but elsewhere they are packaged and shipped and people are buying them. But now there was a post that was talking about uh, that they may cause psychological damage. And then of course, our own back home. So Safaricom Azuri, which is a chatbot, and most of you will interact with Safaricom environment, most likely, you've interacted with Zuri, who is the chatbot. So the question is, uh, then what is intelligence? So there are, there, are, there are two words, natural, artificial and intelligence. So I was quickly looking at the definition of intelligence and from addition, it says ability to learn, understand and make judgments or have opinions that are based on reason. So there's learning, there is understanding and making judgments or opinions that are based on reason. Another definition says uh, learning, reasoning, understanding, and similar forms of mental activity, up to doing gra grasping truths, relationships, facts, meanings. And uh, there was a gentleman called Gartner that came up with what is called the multiple intelligence theory. So there is one view that says intelligence is uh, one, what is called the single intelligence view, but Gartner came up with a multiple intelligence view. And the theory claims that humans have different types uh, of intelligence, and each of these are independent. So he came with different categories from verbal, strong linguistic, those who can understand and appreciate language very well, to logical, stroke mathematical, those who can appreciate numbers, to visual, stroke spatial, those who can think in images, to bodily, stroke kinetic. Nowadays, we have uh, dancers who do that as a profession. So those who can coordinate their body movements very well, 
We have musical stroke rhythmic intelligence. We have people who can compose very good music. We have interpersonal or social intelligence that allows us to relate well with others. But we also have intrapersonal introspective that allows us to understand uh, oneself, our motivation, and uh, some of the personal concepts. And of course, we have natural intelligence that allows us to differentiate flora from fauna. And I was looking at a paper that was looking at just building on Gartner's multiple intelligence theory. And the paper was talking about integrating multiple intelligence and AI in language learning, enhancing personalization and engagement. Most of us are teachers, so when you teach in class, students learn at different rates. So you can imagine if we can adopt learning to the needs of the student based on where they have a challenge. So again, all these are possibilities. So then what is artificial intelligence? So it develops uh, theories, methods, techniques, and applications for simulating and extending human intelligence. We quickly look at intelligence and the core things about solving problems. So whatever we do that involves intelligence, take that and put it to machines, then we refer to that as, as artificial intelligence. And of course, we already looked at some of the founders, John McCarthy, and who decided the science engineering of making intelligent mach machines, especially intelligent computer programs. Right from the start, AI was multidisciplinary to date. AI is multidisciplinary. So you have databases, you have knowledge discovery in databases, you have data mining, you have machine learning, you have neurocomputing that basically borrows from our, our brain, brain models. And if we understand how the brain, model, brain models work, then we can train machines to learn. Pattern recognition and of course, statistics, very, very, very important. All right, so quickly on the AI technologies, I just give a very quick overview. So we have the process, we have the chips, we have device, we have algorithm, and of course we have the different applications. So in terms of the process, we talk of on-chip memory, just for fast execution of the tasks, because uh, AI uh, models are, are resource inten intensive. So you have on-chip memory, it becomes easier for us to run applications faster. Just give an example, you have uh, the new, new, new RAM chips or the FPGA, the field uh, programmable uh, get arrays, all these are uh, upcoming uh, RAM technologies that makes it easier for us to run a large amount of uh, data without having limitations of the computing resources. You have the device, so new computing device, bionic device, which are implanted into bodies that will allow the body to operate as close as possible to the normal body. And I was looking at, uh, I, I looked at some blog that was talking about the first person ever to receive a fully functional bionic bionic hand with AI. So when you have a bionic hand, it means it will function as close as possible to the uh, normal hand. Then of course, we have high bandwidth of chip memory, again, just to ensure that we run off our jobs faster. Then of course, we have the chips. So we have chips which are optimized for uh, processing, uh, especially deep learning and machine learning tasks. We have algorithms, both in terms of deep learning and machine learning. And of course, the applications now are varied from video and image to voice to text and to control. I was looking at Amazon. Currently, we have automated workflows. You don't have to have any machine learning skills. You just log in, create an account, you submit your data, and you get your output on the other side. Huawei also has what is called Model Arts, which is an automated workflow online. So you log in, you get the service. Once you procure the VM, you give in your data, and the process is done automated, automatically until finally you get your output. All right, so I quickly just looking at some of the common terms in, in AI. So we have AI, machine learning, and deep learning. So AI will focus on research and development of theories, methods, techniques, and application systems for simulating and extending human intelligence. Then machine learning becomes a subset of AI. There are many others, but I just closed on machine learning. So here the idea is how computers can obtain new knowledge or skills by simulating or performing learning behavior. So we understand how human beings learn once we understand how human beings learn, then we create now artificial models for learning. And then finally, we have deep learning, again, a subset of a machine learning that allows us to simulate the brain. So here is learning at the brain level. And then once we uh, train the model to run, then the model can recognize images, sounds, and texts. So this is just simple a difference, difference between the machine learning and deep learning. So you have your input data here, which could be a car. So of course, we'll get features of this car into a matrix or an array. And then we extract the features and then we feed it to a model to get output. But now with deep learning, so the feature extraction is 
combined as part of the model building. So here it is separate. There the me and you has to do the feature extraction before we can fit the same to the model. But here this is done automatic, automatically by the model. So once we get our input features, we feed it to the model, the feature extraction mm -hmm. classification is done automatically, and then finally we get our output. Okay, so we'll take questions at the end. So allow me to just proceed. So I was quickly looking at how humans learn and how machines learn. So me and you, from experience, we get induction. Induction is uh, the knowledge we acquire over time. Then once we get induction, if you get new problems, we can now use regularity built from induction to make future predictions. So this is how it works in the workplace. So you get very good mechanics that may not be very good at pronouncing the words or the parts of the car, but because of induction and regularity, they can solve your problem. Now we transfer the same to machine learning. So we get historical data. So this experience in machine learning comes from data. So more often in machine learning, you hear about data set, right? So that gives us the experience. And then once, we through training, the model learns the features of this data. If you get new data, then the model can be able to classify feature attributes. So the difference between the normal learning and the machine learning is basically the experience comes from data. So we have the experience that comes from the data, and then we apply the algorithm for a particular task, which can be agriculture, health, education, ETC. And then finally, we get a performance measure P that allows us to monitor how well the model is doing. A common one is normally accuracy, where you just get, if you have 10 examples, for example, you want to know how many of those are correctly classified over the total number. So for example, if 60 are correctly classified over 10, then we say the accuracy is 60%. All right, then again, just trying to compare the, no, the rule-based algorithm. So you have a rule in form of condition action pairs. So you have, if this condition, then do this. The condition cannot be true or false. So you can nest as many of these as possible. But now with machine learning, once we have our training data, then we pass, we give the, uh, this data to the algorithm. The algorithm will learn, and then we create a model. And then once this model has been created and we save it, given new data, then the model can make prediction. So the process of writing manual rules is now replaced by automated or automated way of learning the rules. All right, so quickly on the industry ecosystem. So the four elements of AI, four elements of AI. So we have data, we have algorithms, we have computing power and the scenarios. So data, of course, we say these are the, uh, the example or what we call the scenarios. So data can come from health, can come from agriculture, can come from education, from business, any. Then we have the algorithms now that act on the data. The computing power is the infrastructure. This is basically like either you are personal computer, or we are in the era of high performance computing. So we have servers that can do that. And of course, scenario are the use cases. So at the lowest level, you have the infrastructure. So this can be internet, can be sensors, and IoT. IoT in full is internet of things. So we can have sensors that can collect data. That data can be sent to the cloud, in terms of technologies, big data, and cloud computing. And then the AI elements, we already talked about data, the algorithms, and the computing power. And then finally, different technical directions from the computer vision, to speech processing, to natural language and processing, to planning and uh, decision-making systems, and of course, to big data analysis. And then at the, top, at the upper layer, we have now the different applications. Uh, our friends from the industry will take us through some of the applications that they have done. All right, then finally, the subfields of AI. So there are many from robotics to computer graphics, to multimedia technology, to human computer interaction, to database technology, to visualization information retrieval and recommendation to knowledge engineering. Those who've been to DBpedia, I know we're used to Wikipedia, but there's something else called DBpedia, which is an example of an ontology to data mining, to machine learning, to speech processing, natural language and processing, finally to computer vision. So this then gives us an overview of what AI is. We've done AI, we've differentiated AI from natural intelligence, looked at some of the application areas, the technical, the, the technology stack, and now we've summarized with the subfields of AI. I wish to pass the button to Dr. Nehru. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uyel. Um, I would want to share my screen. So I, uh, Mr. Uyel has done a good job of uh, putting into perspective uh, areas around uh, uh, the introduction to AI such. 
So I would want to continue that journey and take the shortest time, the 10 minutes, around the question of uh, uh, my focus will be uh, focusing a bit on generative AI. I'll also be very much interested in looking at how the Global South is benefiting or not benefiting from AI and, 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 and such. So I'm uh, uh, the chair department of computing. I'm also the founder of JHub, which is based at JQuark and the founder was member of the G uh, Digital Innovation Hub that is based at Cosa City and uh, also a digital connector at Digital Africa and a review of applied machine learning days. So my uh, first uh, argument is that AI is not the future of technology. It is the technology of today that is shaping our future. That's the theme of my, my, my section of the talk, that the things that uh, sounded like uh, science fiction, they are now a reality. And that's why as uh, individuals working in various industries, there is need for us to see how we can integrate it and also benefit from it. So to start with, if you look at uh, uh, the movement uh, from what we have in AI, from what you can do in ChatGTP, for example, you had the uh, images that uh, you had to load to the, uh, like for example, the, the largest image uh, data set like ImageNet. Today, you can just write a few sentences and tell the ChatGTP to be able to generate for you an output that is ordered uh, like activities that you can carry out. So this tells you that that journey, the steps are gradual, but they are real, uh, a reality and the impact is, is clear. So which industries are being affected? The banking and financial sector, uh, you have things like enhanced customer experience and also improving experience, uh, operations. We have healthcare, we have also education, and I'll touch more on education because I believe that this is an area that uh, being a university, a number of us are, are related to it. Manufacturing and also retail, uh, those are areas that are really affected by it. Now, in terms of education, if I look at um, uh, what it can do uh, in, and what it is already doing is, for example, enhancing the learning experience. And I believe this will continue. Tools like ChatGTP you can be able to assist the student in completing assignment and providing personalized feedback, which is something that over years, uh, e-learning systems have been looking at. There is immediate assistance and support, running process more efficient and effective. There is also um, the issue of students getting that engaging experience that can help them uh, uh, get their full potential. That is a uh, crucial part. But we also need to think, how does... Uh, uh, teaching and learning, how is it affected in general? Like, for example, assessment. Uh, we have not had the, a policy on that, and I believe that we need to think about that, that as an example. So here is a, a, a data that looks at uh, processes that rely heavily on AI, and in terms of, for example, revenue by use case. So you look at, uh, for example, vehicle detection and avoidance. That's already a well-established industry where solutions are out there. We have static image recognition, processing of patient data, arithmetic trading, rockerized mapping. We also have uh, predictive maintenance, cybersecurity and threat, uh, paperwork of digital data conversion, uh, uh, also another area that is benefiting, intelligent HR system, medical image analysis. Those are, that shows you the industries and how, uh, in terms of revenue, this growth is affecting them. If you look at uh, how do organization and readers do perceive AI, you'll see that there are those people who see AI and machine learning are, as game changers. And I think uh, it's not just any other technology. This is what I see, 71%. AI is used to singling out opportunities using data, uh, 61%. AI and machine learning are, are, are their most uh, significant initiative uh, in, in like 61 uh, organizations and readers. AI tools have boosted productivity. In fact, this is one thing that um, is, is, is well noted even in Gartner reports around the question of tools that improve productivity for users uh, who are using AI. Whether you are in, I, I attended a, a meeting where we had the news reporters giving how their productivity has been affected in terms of, for example, writing of um, uh, news articles. And they were saying, we used to write one article in a week. Now they say we are, we, are, we are able to generate three or two articles. 
And the issue is that the tools that they are working with have a history. So they create like a, a kind of a theme in how they do the job. Projected increase in labor productivity from AI use, that's about 40. And here we have the, what are the top benefits of AI uh, adoption? So you can see that uh, uh, there, there, there are well uh, benefits around reducing waste, uh, improving performance, all those are, are things that organizations have noted have a real value in them. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, as, as, as organizations that needs to be aware of, of, of data and AI and what data can do for them and what AI can, we have to look at awareness. And this is an area that I think part of this uh, kind of web we are organized by uh, uh, the research department is, is a very important, research directory is very important. So understanding the basics of AI and its potential implications, skills acquisition, upskilling the team and attending the workshops and such, creating a clear and robust strategy for AI integration. There is implementation, so specific areas, evaluation, that is you're trying to review AI performance and making some adjustment, full integration into it, and then continuous improvement. This is an area that is continuously expanding. So you need to look at that. And then there is monitoring trends, industry and technology uh, development. This is one way in which organizations can adopt to it. Now, there's, there's something alongside the bridging the AI gap, the economic challenges in the global south, which is a, a big issue that um, we can no longer ignore because there's cost disparity. AI development, implementation, and maintenance are very cost, uh, are very costly for global south to be able to be engaged in the whole development of the whole item in a quality amplifier. Like for example, the current economic divide, what it does is that it, the benefits of AI are to the ones who already have that technology and that's a big one. Then innovation hidden, like a uh, promise of AI driven innovations remains erosive as high cost in the, the global South active participation in the AI landscape. This um, uh, uh, slide, uh, the size of AI models and uh, Oyel has mentioned alongside that. If you look at, the kind of um, organizations that are involved up to 2022, you can see that these are global brands that are there. They are, of course, the ones who are making money out of uh, this kind of thing. But we have a problem because we also have our people being used in, in creating some of these models. And that's why I'm saying we need to think of how uh, AI is, 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 is generally uh, benefiting or not benefiting us. So for example, uh, cost of it, you, the benefits you can maybe chat about any topic, you can generate realistic image, false and misleading information can be obtained, uh, propaganda, deception, bias and hallucination. Those are things that you have seen as, as areas that chat GDP uh, uh, needs to be tackled. There is homogeneity and misrepresentation of language and culture. Those ones who have their data and algorithm online ends up being the ones who are all represented harmful and violent content. We have private information, uh, copyright infringement, we have seen that. So um, we can also look at, for example, the way it, will it is affecting the assessment of students. Assessing all burning questions is an interesting one because you can run, do your homework for you. Does it do it, in a, is it a positive contribution? It, how, how do you use it? Gather your data to improve models, exploitation of underpaid workers, and this is something that we all know, erosion of rich uh, human practices. And then there is also raising the barrier to entry in AI. Uh, also, uh, uh, a research that looks at carbon emission and the footprint that uh, AI is, is living on that in terms of the use of energy, water, and such, and also rare metals for manufacturing it. So uh, these are also uh, some of the uh, uh, what the large language uh, models or data AI models require or what they are uh, interfering with. For example, copyright, uh, who does web content belong to? Uh, how do we enforce licenses and other rights? That has been something that is coming up. Content, which websites are acceptable and according to who? Uh, concept, uh, uh, who should be, uh, who, whom should we opt out mechanism that you can remove your data from a training set or you opt in. So if you go visit a site, that do they does that give them a right to use your data for training models 
and all that kind of thing. So this is an example of a negative scenario where we have open AI used Kenya workers on less than $2 per hour to make chat GTP less toxic. And this uh, filtering and annotating data is hard and thankless. Most of the human workers had for these would come from the underpaid and also marginalized. And they are often left with psychological damage due to content that they moderate. Because as you know, uh, these social media and such can be mean. And, and this is one of the negative ways that we look at and see ourselves uh, suffering. This is around the carbon footprint. The cost is very high, as you can see. And, and that's something that we also have to manage. So um, the, 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 the pitfalls, how do we navigate that evaluation? The truth is that there are things we do, we still don't know about AI and uh, uh, we are learning about them as we go. And, and the issue is that, are we going to, to be people who inform commission to investigate what would have been done to try and talk about repatriations and, and such? So narrative is controlled by the ones with data and algorithm uh, and, and algorithms do not care about that you have that. So for example, if you look at this kind of argument, a uh, good scientist raise an agenda, you give it data that is predominantly white and male, returns that. And, and that eventually ends up being a, a way in which the model will, will, will understand that. Uh, and we have seen that also happening in social media. My final, final thoughts as I invite um, Chavay Karyuki is that um, AI has uh, brought in genuine innovations and improved our work, enhancing tools like research and navigation. It will uh, continue. Uh, uh, and, and it will continue to do that. And the question is, as we continue building innovation, are we going to be the people who are only users to that? And biases, societal impacts uh, by the accelerated AI development and increased opacity. So you have some models like the one I have pointed out, some of them build like, for example, using tons of tools. There's nobody or a, a second uh, person to look at it to be able to evaluate. So there are some uncertain about the implication and the workings of those models that we don't. So I uh, would want to now welcome um, Tebe to give us a case study on the industry. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, you can take it up, uh, Mr. Tebe Karyuki. Uh, uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Deru. I'll just um, share my screen. I hope you can all see it. Yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you, Dr. Nderu, and to every all the participants. Um, it's uh, good to, to be with you today. And so as Dr. Nderu mentioned, my name is Amtembe Karuki, uh, co-founder and CEO of a startup called Fastaga. We actually started in the journey of doing machine learning back in 2017 when it was the first, re you know, one of the big... Um, a chatbot at uh, times, uh, we were looking at um, you using um, chatbots on the back end and USSD to collect data from, from people and, and engage with uh, climate and um, clean tech companies in terms of the, you know, creating personas for them. Then, then eventually we set, set up our new startup um, in 2029, in, in 2019. Um, which is fast tagger, which has been focused on democratizing AI. And so if you look at the name fast tagging, that's where we were coming up with the name of, uh, we really need to create a lot of training data for use cases uh, for the African continent. And so, yes, that's that's my my background. My first interaction was with AI or, you know, uh, machine intelligence was, um, I think when I was 12, when I, I, I engaged with Eliza, which was the chatbot that was built in 1960s, um, you know, just next uh, word prediction. So let me, oh, ah, sorry about that. Um, let me share again. Okay, I'm just trying to see why the, it's not moving. Okay, yes. So 
Um, we are a team of um, three, three Kenyans um, with strong backgrounds in machine learning and data. And so that's what Fastag is. And currently our product is um, helping MSMEs um, scale by doing analyzing data, showing them who their customers are and automatically engaging with those customers. So if you look at this particular image, I'm sure most of us know who it is that we're looking at on that image. However, uh, this is the result that uh, an AI that was being used to you know, um, clear up the image came up with. And this is because as we have been having conversations, you know, AI is all about the training data. And if you look at the world right now, most of the data sets that have been used to train AI have largely come from the US and, and repeatedly been used in terms of um, this about uh, 1,900, almost 2,000 data sets which have been used over 3,000 times to uh, perform benchmarking um, you know, with different research papers. And so you can see how there's still a lot of opportunity if we're in terms of building AI, whether it's generative, whether it's um, supervised learning. And so there's still a lot as uh, Dr. Nderu and, and the previous speaker were saying this year, is that there's still a lot of opportunity in, in building AI and we still have a lot to learn. And you know, this is where probably things such as misinformation come. And that's why it's important for us, you know, here on the continent, you know, students of JQUAT and other people to actually participate in building AI and you know, creating these data sets. So of course, you know, with supervised learning and also with deep learning, there's a lot of you know data preparation that goes in it. You know, it takes up to a million images, um, you know, to make a deep learning model um, of, of something. Right, which is about 10 to 100,000 uh, man hours. This is changing a lot and has changed a lot, but that still shows you why, you know, um, ChatGPT needed to work with young people um, in Kenya. Um, just continuing from this, I think there's a big need of democratizing artificial intelligence. And I believe uh, we are the talent that is required to help Africa, you know, not miss out from the benefits of AI due to the lack of training data and data sets and AI models that are built on, on the continent. So I know there's a lot of really good work being done by people, you know, um, such as uh, Kathleen Simiu um, and others, you know, um, like Leonida, uh, in terms of building data sets in different spaces. There's also, you know, uh, Dr. Um, Lillian, um, um, also who's also building like the Luya, you know, corpus for language. There's Swahili corpus. Right now, there's a Masakane group of people who are at Kilifi, um, and so there's a lot of opportunity to build AI for health uh, sector. But we need the data for infrastructure, solar, for agriculture, and so there's a lot of opportunity. And there are a lot of startups which are doing this. You know, there's you know such startups such as Amini, uh, us, uh, you know ourselves as fast aga we worked with airbus also on satellite data you know um working on uh building um in that particular space and there are a lot of other people and so this is opportunities for young people you know um who are in university to actually look at these particular spaces so they say that ai is going to create about 15.7 trillion dollars to the to add it to the global economy by 2030 and we really don't want africa to miss out on that and if you look at the AI value creation in the next three years, this is according to Andrew Ning, who's you know one of the pioneers of a lot of um, what we are seeing right now with AI. Uh, supervised learning is still one of the biggest spaces, right? You know, being able to get training data, label it, and then you know come up with systems such as fraud detection. Um, generative AI is still small, but it's growing. You know, all the ideas of generating image, generating like words. Um, unsupervised learning is also slowly growing and reinforcement learning as well, you know, building agents which, you know, can learn by interacting with the environment. Um, that's also growing. And so I wanted to make this really practical and say that, you know, as if you're, you're a student, you're in university, or you're, you know, someone who's thinking of doing a startup or you're a researcher, I think open source AI tools and large language models can be used to um, start your AI journey. So for example, you know, we're talking about, you know, um, get making sure you, you you know, open source AI tools and software frameworks and libraries such as TensorFlow and PyTorch are some of the things that people can already start using. Um, there's also other open, you know, open source AI tools such as um, um, Scikit, Learn, Keras, OpenCV for if you're doing computer vision work. Um, if, if you're in, in terms of language models right now, there's Lama 2 by Meta, of course, uh, ChatGPT 
uh, four is, is quite 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 free. Um, uh, sorry, the three point five is free. There's Byte by Google, and there's a lot of others that you, you we can actually use um, in terms of the open source space. And and then in terms of resources for learning, there's different platforms. There's Coursera, Zindi, Udacity, Kaggle. You know, you can do competitions, get access to data sets that you can use to try to build at least some um, supervised learning um, tools. You know, um, then there's, you know, familiarizing yourself with, you know, the concepts, uh, learn programming languages. So Python is the one which is being used mostly. Um, you know, there are libraries such as NumPy, Pandas, uh, Matplotlib. Um, and then you start getting the mastering the basics of machine learning algorithms, you know, um, and then that will help you a lot. K Square and others, and then sharing with the community. There's AI Kenya, which exists right now. You could, you know, e easily like become members of AI Kenya and um, have conversations with. Them. If you're more into NLP, there's Masakane, um, and and there are also other groups uh, that are doing things. And then um, just let me quickly jump on to so for example there are a lot of tools you know both on nlp data analytics and machine learning and so some of the I, I i would like to say that if you're thinking of being an innovator the thing is to mostly focus on a problem that exists so journalists have problems with you know fact checking content generation um you know personalizing news recommendations so if you're thinking of a solution think about problems that different spaces have so if it's in journalists what problems do they have and how can you innovate there how can you become come up with an automatic automated fact generate um, checking machine a content generation um use gpt that's easier to be used for you know news um agencies um, if you're in, in looking at creating solutions for people in the in video production space, a lot of them probably maybe don't want to go and you know start using the tools themselves. So how can you customize something that helps them to do musical composition? Um, you know, automate their videos. I've done a lot of my um, you know promotion videos using you know AI tools right now. If you're in looking at innovating in the healthcare industry, there's a lot of startups now that are actually doing a lot of work in medical diagnosis, you know, virtual nurse assistance, drug discovery. These are innovations that you can build um, in the financial space, investment management, accounting, fraud detection. These are big problems that are happening. Can we come up with solutions, right? Can you use some of these open source tools and some data that is there on places like Kaggle or Zindi and come up with some solutions and sell them to banks and others, um, you know, marketing as of course, ad targeting, predictive analytics, chatbots. Um, in the legal space, you've already seen that there's someone who came up with a legal tool here in Kenya for a GPT tool. They, you know, using, you know, optimizing prompts and focusing on Kenya um, using chat GPT 3.5, GPT 3.5. Um, and then Always some things to consider, you know, right now, of course, we are seeing even chat GPT-4 with the GPTs that they've, the, that they've allowed people to be able to create, you know, it's, leak, it's, it's leaking a, um, a lot of uh, its training data and other uh, challenges. So always make sure that data security is a big thing that you're thinking about um, um, and, and train people and make sure that the cost and the ROI in terms of especially compute that you're considering how you're using that compute. So other use cases, particularly for Kenya, that I would recommend people to start checking out is forage availability and depletion predictions. So right now you can you know go to Landsat or to places such as um, um, the European Space Agency, Copernicus Images. They are free. What can you do in terms of building some machine learning algorithms like for Kenya that can you know predict whether there's going to be conflict conflict between pastoralists and and um, and uh, farming communities, right? Um, AI and voice technologies. How can you come up with some good trans, you know, um, interactive voice recognition software which is automated to work with farmers in different languages? How can you start collecting this data? Um, how can right now there's a lot of challenges within with dermatology because you know we haven't collected enough data on African skin. So this is something we did as a small project um, at our startup, and we see that it's still a big need. Maritime security, piracy, that's still happening, illegal fishing. How can you work with, you know, satellite imagery and put it on drones and, you know, a model on a drone and be able to spot this? Security space um, is one that needs this. Wildlife tracking and monitoring. How can you also do this um, in conservation using AI, uh, the drones? How can you spot a specific animal and be able to track it over time for conservation? 
in the energy space, we did some work, um, you know, on on dictating the rooftop detection algorithms that could, you know, predict where you should put um, models. In the creative industry, of course, there's a lot of use cases that you could you could have um, for for artists and um, you know fashion designers and you know different individuals in, in the in the creative space. And I think this is where actually most use cases are. This, for example, I created using Dali E, you know, you know, you know, but you have to be able to do the prompting well. This again was through Dali, so it's very, very um, uh, realistic. You know, I just asked it to come up with, you know, musicians and you know, film producers in the in in Africa, and this is what it came up with. And so, if you're coming up, you need to come up with content, then Dali is very easy to use. And I think even the opportunities for gig work, even though a lot of people say that, you know, yes, there's the challenge with some of the, the content, um, a lot of the third party data labeling space, because, you know, supervised learning is continue, going to continue to grow. It's uh, already reached a $4, 000, uh, $4 billion uh, dollar, uh, market th uh, this year and will continue growing, right? Because that's this supervised learning is still the one that's going to grow the most. And I think that also pre presents an opportunity for Kenya to be an outsourcing market for that, at least for the jobs that are, you know, easy to do and, and not um, dangerous. And this is already employing about 100,000 young people um, in Kenya. And I don't think we should, you know, shy away from that. So overall, I think there's a lot of opportunities for young people to get into this space using a lot of the open source models, you know, things such as Llama, get, you know, credits from some of these, um, you know, big players such as AWS, um, you know, Google, uh, GCP, they have a lot of uh, credits they give, they can give you for free that you can test out on your on your machine. Today, Llama, you can actually, Llama 2, you can actually, it's a 1GB file you can download on your laptop and work on it. And so as a startup, uh, for us, we really think there's a lot of opportunity to do um, AI on the continent. And as you as said before, there's a huge gap in terms of data that has been used to build AI. So we have a lot of opportunities. So with that, I say that, you know, there's a lot of opportunities even for, for young people on the continent who have mobile, you know, to get some jobs um, on, in this particular space. And I thank you. And um, later I can be open for, for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Mutebe. I think we we are now at a point when we can uh, be able to ask question, interact with any of the speakers, and uh, we are opening the floor for that. So if you have any question, you just raise up your hand, or you just unmute yourself and go ahead and uh, uh, ask the question or comment, and also we can have uh, them written on the chat. Questions written on the chat. So I think uh, uh, I may go fast and uh, as, as we wait for the other people to ask, I have a question for you in relation to the way you say um, um, the jobs, the job market. Yes, I fully agree with you that uh, we, we need to see that as an opportunity for our people. And that's uh, the reality that there is a lot of opportunities there. But we know in the past, you have not gotten it right. So what do you think? Uh, and, and we are case study in some of the books or articles written on how AI can be misused. So what would you, what would you, do you say you need to do to avoid that? Yeah, so uh, I think that's a very good question. Um, and if I look at India as an example, India has become a juggernaut in the tech space. And you can look at most of the CEOs, even of the tech companies in the US, and most of them are Indian. And if you look at the way they started, they started as an outsourcing space, right? Um, so I think there's some models already that are using Time Magazine also showed like a model where, you know, uh, one of these companies in, in, in India, which does data labeling, you know, the young people, you know, uh, and the people who are doing it, you know, housewives and everyone are getting, you know, a good percentage of um, of the data labeling money and they're doing safe work like on their mobile phones. So I think there's a lot of examples of how it can be done in a very ethical way. I mean, we in 2021, we ended up like uh, providing income for about um, 100 young people. Uh, we had a partnership with Kepsa and, you know, they they made up to, you know, $250 um, in a month doing very basic 
data labeling work or of tagging categorization, you know, telling you this is a face, is this a house and very safe work. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space. And um, we can use this to have more young people actually ha get digi basic digital skills. And then from there, they can actually start doing more complex work in the future. And so I think that's where the opportunity lies in, right? When you start getting people to get these digital skills and then they have an interest and then you start, um, you know, um, upskilling them, I think that's where you get a lot of opportunity and upside. And that that is where I think our focus should be. And we look at, you know, India and the way they are doing it successfully. I think we can do it. We have a very standardized English, which is much better than most of the world. So categorization work is really good. Um, and and as I and and as as um, Andrew Ning like showed, there's going to be a the, the biggest space is going to be in the supervised learning where you need to label a lot of data, and you can see even the gap in Africa. So we need to build our own AI. So we need to actually collect our data. We know how to manage it. We know how it can be safe, and we need to to label that languages and everything. And that's where a big opportunity op opens up for us for translation and for media monitoring and so many things. And I think that's how we we, we should focus um, on even for our own data sets, which don't exist yet. I hope that answers the question. Yes, yes, and thank you, thank you. So I think uh, as we wait, uh, the, the other question still uh, for me as we wait for uh, members, I would want to hear a question is on the issue of startup ecosystem. I see that uh, uh, data annotation and, and such is also an active area for startups. Um, uh, do you feel like uh, Africa on the market share startups in the AI space is still very uh, problematic? because we are more of users. Yes, we, we need to move ourselves from users to actually building more. And that is on us. Um, right now, OpenAI has raised about $11 billion. And, uh, you know, Africa, the entire Africa, uh, our, our highest raise of VC capital was 6.5 6, 6. 6. million. Uh, sorry, 6.5 billion. So you can see already we are not, not much is being invested, but it's also because we are not building unique solutions. We're just using a lot of technology. And I think we need to do a lot more of that, building unique technology ourselves. Okay, there's a question being asked here by Naomi Ketel, uh, who is asking, what was the data mine from eyeballs in Kenya a few months ago, part of what was well, the I'm data sorry, mining? Yeah. They are there. I, I can't answer because that's WorldCoin and I, I don't have any relation with them. Okay, okay. So uh, are, are there any cases of AI used in government elsewhere uh, to any of the presenters? Use of AI in government? I think, uh, yes, we can, uh, from my end, I can uh, answer part of that as I open up, maybe even to Mr. Yell to say something. We know uh, that uh, countries are using them even at the airport, even uh, for security. Of course, some of the use cases are going past uh, privacy, uh, and, and there's always a balance between uh, uh, there's always a balance between uh, security and uh, uh, privacy, and that's a, a big big topic uh, on what AI is, how AI is breaking that. So that that question on uh, 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 are there any op sorry so so the question the whole question was are there any opportunities for AI to provide solutions in Kenya government or are there cases of AI use in uh, in government elsewhere uh, to any of the presenters so I think for my argument is that yes we have those cases so opportunities maybe Phil Poyel you can take that. Yes, of course, we are currently talking of smart uh, cities and uh, uh, a lot of effort is being done to position Nairobi as a smart city. So smart cities are driven by AI. You have uh, cameras, you've seen those cameras. I know currently the data is being uh, shared somewhere and uh, a lot of work is being done on the back end. So yes, opportunities are there because to make our environment smart, then AI has to play a bigger role. I know the infrastructure has been set up, Safaricom, who are we, uh, they are supporting the government and a lot of work is being done on the background. Maybe what has not been done is sharing of the same so that the public gets to know uh, what are the, the opportunities that exist and what has already been done. Thank you. 
Sam Tibby, who wants to comment? Okay. Yes. So, yes. Um, yes so there, there. So in terms of chatbots, so the um, the office of the data Pro protection commissioner is already using a chatbot to answer most questions. Um, there's also um, a chatbot being that has been trained even to understand sharing that is being used by. Anything you want to know about um, how to access. Um, you know, our startup business in Kenya, all through the platform. So those are some of the ones that I know. Yes, uh, actually, we also have a project with them, the Data Protection Office, trying to um, understand, yes, the Data Protection Act and, and trying to assist. So creating a solution that is using that sooner or later, we'll be able to share uh, those kind of solutions as well to add to the tools that are being created. Um, I think uh, I, I don't see anybody else with or any other question that is posted on the uh, chat. I, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, it's more of a speculative question. Just don't know if it's related to AI. And this uh, rumor that's going around that uh, the Kenya government wants to introduce new registration at birth. Uh, of course, Bill gets being mentioned a lot. Because once a child is born, there'll be a chip inserted and you don't need any other registration. Will this be linked to AI? So the, 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 what I would say partly on, on my answer is that uh, I, I do not uh, have um, proper information around that. But what I would imagine is that if you're going to take that path in this day and age, we have a constitution that safeguards a lot of those things that uh, are, uh, though I know that uh, it's possible for the government, we have a constitution that can easily be able to take care of some of those details in a very uh, thorough way. But uh, I wouldn't really say I'm answering on behalf of knowing what is happening currently. I'm just saying that um, these are some of the things that we're talking about in terms of data protection and security, and that's a major aspect. I, I think maybe I can open it up for other members still to comment or say something about it. But as far as I know, I would say that uh, really uh, some of these ideas, uh, especially the one on on starting a chip and, and such, which is, which is something that uh, uh, is 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 not impossible, but of course is something that uh, uh, is safeguarded well within our provision of privacy of uh, ourselves. Uh, so maybe oh, yeah, I can maybe... put there. Oh, sorry. I don't know. Oh, sorry. So so first, I, the, the, I don't think there's anything about a chip, um, and I think it should be careful not to follow so much of um, the uh, fringe, you know, science conversations. Um, it, it's the same way that you'd have like a registry of births, you know, it, they, they, a birth certificate. I don't think there's any difference from from that. So there's no chip. I think that's just the rumors. Yeah, I wanted to say I used to chair a technical committee at Kenya Bureau of Standards on cards and personal identification. And the challenge has always been, do we have, can we have as a country a one point of registration that allows the data to be stored in one center and then shared across? Mm -hmm. Currently, data is spread everywhere. And uh, of course, uh, the challenges of unifying that so that one person collects the data at some point, the discussion was then who then collects that data and shares with everybody else so that you have data stored in one central place. So I know a lot, that discussion has been there for some time. But as Mutembe says, you also have a lot of uh, rumors on the ground, uh, especially the rumor was uh, bench, I mean, was uh, was anchoring on external partners, external external partners who, who basically want to use uh, their influence to ensure that uh, those chips are inserted. So there are rumors. But I know in terms of uh, uh, in our committee, we had people from immigration, we had guys from different sectors. And the question was, how do we then? OK, so I yeah, think, I, uh, I, go ahead. 
if I may ask uh, uh, Oyer, Philip, um, is, during the war, like at the moment, the war between uh, the uh, Israelites and the Hamas, is in the artificial uh, 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 intelligence playing a bigger role in determining which direction it will take? Mr. Yell, is a question for you, uh, and we can't hear you. So the, the general comment is that uh, for sure AI in warfare is something, in fact, there is a concern on dual use of this technology, and there is a body that is looking at that, dual use of technology in warfare. So I... Uh, would really uh, I, I say that uh, I wouldn't rule out its use, and that is something that uh, um, even governments are, are investing on. But specific answers to that war itself may be something that uh, maybe the if somebody else has, has more details can provide. But I think I would say yes, uh, this technology of AI has the dual use, which means it can be used for even warfare, and, and, and uh, that is something that we cannot rule out as, as, as people. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add something um, to also that conversation of dual use here. So I think it's important to see that AI is a tool, the same way you can have a hammer, and a hammer can be used for many things. And I'm sure a lot of us today have used, I've used when we're using Zoom right now, there's actually artificial intelligence, which is being used for noise cancellation. Um, you know, daily, a lot of us use border borders. Uh, we use, you know, um, cabs. And a lot of the border border riders, they are using Google Maps, right? And that is also uh, using machine learning and, and AI. So I think is not to look at AI as this a more a strange thing that, you know, is coming. But we already benefiting from it. Whenever you look at a video on YouTube, whenever you use TikTok, whenever you use Facebook, uh, whenever you're writing a text and you're getting you know, a suggestion about the word to use, all this is examples of AI um, that exists. And so I think we should appreciate the use and um, see that there are a lot of people who could use it also in a nefarious way. But it's something that we have been using for a very long time. And we should you know, see the benefit that can bring bit, bit for us and also for ourselves. If we want to avoid the negative use of AI or the negative effects, we need to build AI ourselves, not just wait for someone else to build it and decide how we end up using it. So we need to build. Yes, that's, that's very correct, yeah. Yeah, the reason I was saying that is because with the with the um, use of uh, air, 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 I mean artificial intelligence, especially with photographs, uh, it will show that your enemy is getting finished, but actually he's not. You just put photographs together and give the impression, and uh, you know, so long as it's on the uh, social network, it will show that you have cleared the person, but you have not cleared just because of the image. Um, arrangement. Misinformation is a reality. I, I would agree it has been amplified and we know about deep fakes. We know about uh, uh, various stories that have come up that are fake. So I wouldn't really rule out that. And I think maybe uh, that is something, but there is there is that use which is from the social media, but there is that, that other use where now you use, for example, unmanned vehicle, still use of AI and such. Uh, there are all those opportunities that AI can be used for the purpose of improving your uh, winning capability. And, and that's something that you all need to be alert to those extreme users, Mr. Mutebe has said. Maybe one, one final comment. So in this era, seeing is not believing. Kitambo, we used to say what you see is what you get. But we can, uh, I mean, uh, there are AI uh, tools that can uh, create a picture of professor and put you where you are not. And uh, many people will believe that you'll be where you've not. And uh, through that, then a lot of things have happened. So yes, in this era, seeing is not believing. 
uh, Dr. Nero, I thought you talked about the gun, uh, the gun uh, algorithms and what they can do. I know Mutembe mentioned it that we can actually create artificial, I mean, false images of you and put you exactly where you are, where you are not. Yeah, so that's also a concern. There is a question also asked by Fan on another, which is briefly talk about generative AI and its opportunity for teaching and running uh, at the university. I think I mentioned a bit around that, and I would want to hear what others think. But number one, the way I see it is that um, uh, there is an opportunity for students, especially personalized learning. That's the way I see the positive aspect. Uh, to a good extent, we can now build systems that understand the runner, that help them. So personalized running is a big one. Uh, and even for lecturers or teachers or faculty members, they can get to create content uh, using that because they need to check it uh, to avoid um, uh, uh, some of the problems that emanate from the content generated using it. But really is a tool that can be used within that. And um, my, my main concern is that if you look at them, um, current status of, uh, of the examination process where you examine at the Brooms taxonomy of knowledge itself, you are leaving out, uh, students can go out there and just get answers from uh, these generative AI uh, tools and you end up having to mark work that has been generated using that kind of stuff. So we need, that's why maybe in my talk at the beginning somewhere I say that um, we, as, 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 a, as, as Kenya, specifically within our context, we need to think through of how we can be able to have some level of guidance on when to and how to use it and all that kind of thing. And I think maybe I can still allow uh, other people to make a comment on that. Uh, yes, uh, I think some of the tools already. So if you go into Khan Academy right now, um, they're actually using personalized tools, which understands where your level are, is at, at calculus and suggests for you how to improve um, give you like questions which are at your level and then suggest, oh, you know, um, are you sure you want to, you know, what, why, why did you make this particular um, uh, choice? You know, um, any, anyone here who's ever played chess online, you know, you're trying to learn chess, that's one way. I think another thing is that um, in terms of the, in the education space, now we will now focus, I, I believe, um, on real learning whether someone understands something. And you can use ChatGPT to go and research, right? Um, this evening, I'm actually going to be talking to a lot of gig workers. Eh? And, you know, their whole task is going to be, you have a project. How can you use the different AI tools to speed up your editing of an image or, uh, you know, fixing like a, um, a video? Uh, and I, so I think even for programming, a lot of you probably are software development students, right? You can use Copilot uh, by, by Microsoft and other tools to be able to sit with you side by side when you're writing your code and be able to identify the issues. I mean, as a person who's been programming uh, for a few years, I know how frustrating it is when you have like a bug which you don't even know where it is. But now with, you know, you can just put it in your IDE and then it checks your code and it helps you to be more productive. So I think we should look at AI more as a companion that helps us to catch up faster and to learn faster. Yes, there are those people who want to take the shortcut, but at the end of the day, you actually don't learn the content. But if you use AI, you can end up learning faster. Right? So I think we necessarily don't necessarily need to tell people that, oh, you know, it's only focused on an assignment. Give people projects to do where they have to deliver something and, and build something. And because even today, you know, it's when Google came up, you know, there was the time people didn't have Google and now they have Google. But you can see how Google is useful for being able to, to do an assignment and, and, and learn. And so I think that's how we need to look at it as a new tool that helps us be more efficient in what we are doing and not be afraid of, 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 of it. Maybe I'll, I'll take the question uh, on uh, that someone is asking about uh, getting quality data sets. So I know attempts have been done. There is an organization in South Africa called uh, Zindi. So what is Indy does, I'll quickly share the link on the chat. What they done, they collect uh, data sets from uh, companies in Africa. So a company will have a data, data set that they want a solution to be developed. So they organize what is normally called the Umoja Hack, which is an annual event. Then university students from across Africa will participate to solve that problem. 
So the company gives the problem. They also give the prizes in terms of cash in, uh, for the top best solutions. So the community, Zindi community, then uh, will sort up the platform and invite students to come and solve that problem. At the end of it, a company gets a good solution. Zindi, of course, uh, promotes and advocates for use of AI in the African context, and the students get to apply the knowledge. Recently, I, I'm a trainer for Huawei, and uh, we were training, doing a TOT for UNESCO. So a discussion which we had brought was, the, can we get uh, data sets from a Kenyan context now? Because Zindi is Africa-wide, and mostly they'll come from South Africa. I think last time there was a company that is also based in Kenya. But the idea was, can we get companies in Kenya that have data and one solution so that then we can organize a local hackathon meant for Kenyans. And then uh, the students, our students from Jekwat uh, and other universities then can participate. And then we pick the best. So we're still having that discussion. I hope, uh, Felix, once it matures, then we can start bringing, I mean, companies. The issue has always been suspicion that people fear sharing their data. But once we have a good sharing platform, we can anonymize the data so that you cannot link the data to the owner, then hopefully that will pick up. So there's something I'm following up with UNESCO. And once it works, then we can share the story with everybody else to participate. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's good effort. And um, you also realize that uh, maybe another source of data that's strong with the government. And uh, I think that is somewhere where we need to see how there was a time it was easy to get it, but I think that over time changed government, you look at the data that is being released by US, apart from the private entities, which is good that they release it, we also need to think about how we can have a government on the roof, anonymize the data, and perhaps have a way of releasing it. And also big tech companies would be a good one. So I think it uh, uh, looks like uh, we are we're done the conversations and although they can still continue uh, uh, privately or elsewhere, I want to thank the director of research for organizing the event. I don't know whether uh, your team is there so that you can close the session. Thank you so much from the uh, Department of Computing, School of Computing and Information Technology. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Mutebei, for your uh, insightful talk and uh, interesting insights on some areas of benefit. We thank you so much. We thank also uh, Professor Awero and also uh, Mr. Uyel for your participation. Thank you so much. So. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, I just wanted to yeah. add to the data. Um, so I've just added a, a link there for um, Lacuna Fund. So if people are looking for data sets so for agriculture, health, or voice, um, low resource languages, you can find them there. Uh, um, so they have a lot, they've been doing a lot of work on that. If you're also looking for voice, there's the Common Voice by Mozilla. It's a project. You can be able to get some open space uh, data sets there. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say uh, there's also an organization called uh, Local uh, Resource Institute here in Kenya. They've also built a lot of data sets for Kenya for agriculture. So those are some places you can find data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think uh, I pass the button to the director of research. Yes. Hello. I think you can hear me. Yes. I'm representing director of research. The director is not around, but I would like to say thank you. I think I won't repeat what you've just said, but I would like to say thank you to all speakers. Thank you so much. May God really bless you for the insights, for what you have been able to learn. I think it has challenged us as those who are listening to know much more about AI. And I think I would say we are dismissed. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you. Thank you.